Absolutely. Eric Davis. Here. Tyler Benham. Here. Nicole Elman. Here. Karen Flores. Here. Sandy Flores. Here. Jackie Kellogg. Here. Devonna McLaughlin. Here. Moses Malazzo. He's not going to be here, actually. Um, Adra Pyramidic. I'm here. Um, if I lose you guys for any reason, I'm on a shuttle, so let's let you know. Okay. Hey, Adra, no stress, but if we lose you, we might have to um, take a break until you come back to us because Devon is leaving in 15 minutes for a little bit. Okay, no pressure. Come on, AT and C. See how it goes. Try my best. Hey, Ross. There she is. There you go. That takes care of all of your form problems. Who else? Do you need? All right. And that was the full roll call. That was a vote. All right. Move on to housekeeping reminders. So, thank you everyone for being here today. A few reminders to start. This meeting is being recorded. If you're joining online, please avoid using the chat box for general chatter. Instead, enter a C or Q if you have a comment or question during the meeting, and I'll call on you. If for, and for those joining online, please keep yourselves muted if you're not speaking to avoid audio issues. Also, if you need to leave the meeting early, please let us know so we can note the time and have a discussion about forum. And with that out of the way, we will move to agenda item three and open the meeting up to public comment. Any member of the public may address the commission on any subject within its jurisdiction that is not scheduled before the commission on this day. Due to open meeting walls and cannot discuss or act on items presented during this portion of the agenda. To address the commission on an item that is on the agenda, please wait for the call for public comment at the time the item is heard. In giving public comment, please state your full name. And do we have any public comment today? No, Chair. OK. Did we receive any public comments by email? No. All right. And we will move on to agenda item four for the consideration of approval of minutes for the commission meeting on May 26th. I will entertain a motion if someone has one. I move. All right. We have a motion. Do we have a second? A second. All right. So we have a motion and a second by Karen Flores. Is there any discussion on the minutes before we approve? If no discussion, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? All right, that motion carries and the minutes are approved. Next, we'll move to General Bennett general business with agenda item 5A, dealing with the vacant housing commission seats. And Adriana, I believe you have some updates to start us off. Yes, good afternoon commissioner, commissioners. I'm Adriana Fisher, the interim housing project manager for, this, for the housing section. Um, I wanted to just give you guys a quick update on current and upcoming commissioner uh, vacancies. So I have been in contact with three of you. Three of you have terms that are about to expire September 1st, which means that your last meeting will be in August. Um, the vacancies are for one building in real estate professional, two low income housing experts. Um, and then as you have noticed, we have been doing some outreach to um, fill the current developer, builder, and the residential multifamily property management representative vacancies. Uh, and it looks like those we've been struggling with because a lot of the applicants do not currently live within city limits. So with that, um, we have received seven applications so far, two from members of the public, one to two low income housing experts or nonprofits, one from a builder, zero from the developer category, and two to three residential multifamily property management representatives. All of these applications will be going to Council for appointment on August 23rd. Uh, this will take place at the beginning of the meeting, which starts at 3. If you're interested in attending, um, 
welcome to do so, but I'm sure we'll talk about it at the August meeting as well. And then one last thing that I would like to say, I don't think we can say thank you enough. So we understand you're all volunteers. You're choosing to lend us your time, your expertise, your dedication, and your passion for affordable housing. So we understand that the commission takes away time that you could be spending doing something else um, or way more fun things, but you chose to be here anyway today and you chose to join our commission. So we are just super grateful for that. Um, as you can see, the, the product of your hard work for the past couple of years is sitting either in front of you or in your inbox with a 10 year housing plan. And we just want to thank you and just know that this is just the beginning of an amazing future of things that we have done, can, and will do. Um, that's it for me, Chair. I'm happy to answer any questions on this. And then for those of you virtually, I do have the um, a really nice printed copy of the 10 year housing plan for you. So we can coordinate drop offs and pick ups if you want to get it before the next meeting. Okay, I do have one question. Did I understand that two of those applicants are for the builder, developer, or property management positions? Because those seem to be the hardest to fill. Just one. Okay, just one. Okay. Any other questions or discussion before we move on for that update? Um, Tyler, I have a comment about the builder. Just to note that it's a builder seat, um, the person who is the applicant for it. Uh, we do only have one applicant for that seat. Uh, and additionally, they just moved to Flagstaff. They are still looking for housing, it says in the application. So he's not 100% sure he will end up in city limits once they find a house to buy. And if they live outside city limits, such as Katina, Mount Monero, Monte Park, uh, Belmont, any of those areas, they will be eligible for that position. Just to note it. Okay. So we should still be looking hard for someone to fill that position. Always. Yes. All right. Um, if nothing else, we'll move on to agenda item 5B, which is about the cancellation of the July 28th Housing Commission meeting. Um, Adriana, you've got some initial discussion about why the meeting is being canceled. Chair, the, um, there's a question in the chat from Devana. Hey, Devana, go ahead. Sorry, I was just wondering, so did I hear that there were three applicants, though, for the property management seat? Those are three, two to three applications. Yes. Um, Devana, one of them is someone from the from Council Solutions from Northern Arizona. And we do believe that if we needed, that person could potentially uh, fill the low income housing expert seat if we needed that as well. So they could either fill the property manager seat or housing, low income housing expert seat. Gotcha. And then it's going to be heard by council in August. In, in, was I right in that? I checked out for a second. I apologize. We're going to have it scheduled for our first meeting in August with council for our uh, appointments. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, and there's Caesar Q. Nope. Okay. In that case, we'll move back to agenda item 5B about the cancellation of the July 28th Housing Commission meeting. So, um, as you guys can all tell, the housing project manager position is still vacant and has not been published yet. We're working on it as staff. Um, this limits the, the ability of staff to move full force with the 10-year housing plan. For that reason, we are going to cancel the July um, meeting just to give everybody a break and then come back in August full force um, ready to implement short term goals and one year goals. OK. Is there any discussion? Around that? OK. If not, then we'll move to agenda item 5C for the consideration of including a land acknowledgement in future housing commission agendas. The land acknowledgement would read, quote, the housing commission humbly acknowledges the ancestral homelands of this area's indigenous nations and original stewards. 
These lands, still inhabited by native descendants, border mountains sacred to indigenous peoples. We honor them, their legacies, their traditions, and their continued contributions. We celebrate their past, present, and future generations who will forever know this place as home. And on that, I actually have one question to open up the discussion. Is this the exact same language as the land acknowledgement in front of the city council meetings? Almost. The only thing that we changed was the housing commission versus city council. Um, otherwise, it's exactly the same. Okay. Is that your question? Yeah, just for consistency's sake. Um, okay. So, um, in November, I don't know if it has been noticed that City Council added a land acknowledgement in November. This was brought to them by the Ind Indigenous Commission, um, and they presented it to Council in October. It was approved by November. At this point, the purpose of that and the reason why it's being brought forward is because um, it just the, having an acknowledgement on our agenda would allow us to reflect on the historic trauma caused by this, uh, colonialism and open opportunities of meaningful collaboration with and for Indigenous community members, organizations, and nations. Um, recently, the, the Indigenous Commission presented the land acknowledgement to City Council as well as the Sustainability Commission and the Heritage Preservation Commission have added it to their agendas. And because our goal is to provide homes for all Flagstaff residents, as stated on the cover page of our fabulous 10-year housing plan, the land acknowledgement is just another small, impactful action that we could take to add inclusivity and diversity to our work. So we are asking for a motion at this point to adopt that. And is there any discussion before motions? Anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. In that case, do we have a motion? If no one else, I'm... I'll move. Okay. Motion, Ross. Okay, we have a motion. I'll we second. A... <laughs> <laughs> Technology. <laughs> We have a motion from Ross, and I'll give the second to Sandy. <laughs> I think it was Jackie. I'm Nicole. Uh, wait, was it? Okay, Jackie. Um, and we'll give the second to Jackie, and I'm assuming that motion was to add the land acknowledgement to the Housing Commission agendas. Yes. Yes. All right. If there is no discussion on that motion, I'll give a quick pause. All right, then we will vote on that. Um, everyone in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. So and this is where I'm going to leave you guys since it's a minute out before we change topics and I will come back as soon as I can. Okay, thank you for letting us know. Um, do we still have quorum? I'm still here. Thanks, Victor. Okay. In that case, it will just carry through the agenda. Yes, as long as we don't lose the address. Okay. Yeah, if anyone else has to drop off, just let us know so we can take that into consideration. Um, and with that, we're on the discussion items, starting with agenda item 6A, a 2022 bond update from housing staff. And I believe the update is from Sarah Dar, the city of Flagstaff's housing director. So, Sarah, feel, Sarah, feel free to take over. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. And thank you for allowing me to be remote today as well. Um, I do have a quick update for you on the housing bond uh, and the Housing Commission's recommendations, etc. So, I wanted to start with a quick timeline. Of course, as you are all aware, 2019 through 2022, you worked on Housing Commission recommendations to City Council in 2022, actually starting um, a little bit before that. Um, in the fall, we had uh, the Citizens Bond Committee, as appointed by the City Manager, start meeting to consider all of the options for bond 
um, throughout the city organization. On June 7th, the council met to discuss the citizens bond committee recommendations and on June 21st, they passed resolution 2234. Um, I've highlighted some words here because these are the most important ones. Forgive me, um, Stacy's plural city clerks for taking liberty with highlighting words, um, ordering and calling a special bond election for this November to submit two bond questions to the qualified electors of Flagstaff related to general obligation bonds and the aggregate principal amount of 77,285,000 to be repaid with secondary property taxes. So what is in that housing item? I'm clicking, there it goes. Uh, so here are the recommendations you made. Um, you'll remember what we put them into projects with emergency housing, rental housing, and ownership. Um, the ones highlighted in blue are the ones that came as recommendations from the Citizens Housing, Citizens Bond Committee, CBC, and then also forwarded to the ballot by City Council. And how much? So uh, if you'll recall, the Housing Commission did recommendations as one, two, and three in different amounts. I've narrowed these down on the screen for you for the ones that were forwarded for consideration. And to polling places. It's really clear. Did we do it or did we not? Giving opinions and advocating are more of a kind of a gray area. So we always err on the super, super careful side um, of facts and education. Providing election information means we can say election day is on this day and time. There are polling places in these locations. Here's time. Here's this. Here's that. So please be respectful um, and if in doubt, ask. Staff will tell you, I'm sorry, that's not something I can do. Um, so don't be afraid to ask. Uh, we would rather have you ask than assume, um, but then uh, realize that we are limited by law um, and personal, personal liability, not organizational. So what is the role of the Housing Commission in elections? The Housing Commission can also educate by sharing information provided by city staff. Um, we work in this direction, and I'm sure Stacey Fobar can jump in if there's detailed questions in this area. But the Housing Commission, as a body of the city of Flagstaff, can also educate. The Housing Commission cannot take a political position. But what can the people who serve on the Housing Commission do? You as individuals can do pretty much anything you want as long as you clarify that it is you as an individual and what you are talking about is not the position or opinion of the Housing Commission. On the red side, you cannot make statements on behalf of the Housing Commission or use your position title as part of any political statements or materials. We encourage you to also be very, very careful with this so that there are not investigations and accusations and all that jazz that none of us really want to deal with. So please be aware of those. Again, if you have questions, ask. We are absolutely open to folks calling or emailing and saying, all right, I'm thinking about doing X. Can I, can I not? How does this work? I, I don't want to um, violate rules and laws. So next slide, I mentioned informational pamphlet. What is the informational pamphlet? This is the pamphlet that is mailed to every household containing registered voters in advance of the election. The detail is 35 days prior to the election. It's prepared by the city clerk's office and the you everybody actually has the opportunity to submit arguments for and against um, any of the items coming for election, including Proposition 441 and 442. The deadline for those is August 10th, 2022. They are required to be 
sorry, almost sneezing, submitted electronically to the city clerk's office. And there's a lot more information on the, the 2022 elections page on the city's website, talking about form and word limit and what you can say and what you can't say, that type of thing. So if you are interested in submitting such a statement, I would encourage you to visit that link on the city's webpage or not necessarily the link. I did put it here. I acknowledge you don't have this yet. I will email it to you. Um, this was not in your packet because council took this action on Tuesday night. And so we didn't want to give you um, a, pr a presentation in the packet that then we would have to change because we didn't know exactly what council was going to do. So we will email this out to you. So I've heard some questions over some time about, well, what about the Housing Commission now that the bond is um, already, already as if it happened overnight, is now on the ballot? Well, I wanted to remind you that this was one of the main goals, um, policy initiatives and strategies contained in the 10-year housing plan that you all worked so hard on is to create a dedicated funding source for affordable housing in Flagstaff and create 3.1 present a 22 bond measure to council and the community for consideration. So now what? Well, um, I wanna call your attention to the document that created the Housing Commission and the very first responsibility under B1, examine funding sources, make recommendations, including mm -hmm. bond measures and provide oversight of any funds approved by the electorate for housing purposes. So should this bond be approved, it is this body, the Housing Commission, that will provide oversight of those funds. Of course, it is City Council's final um, say in how they are utilized, et cetera, but it is the responsibility of the Housing Commission to provide oversight on behalf of the, oversight and guidance on behalf of the City Council. So Adriana stole my thunder. I hadn't sent this to her in advance, but she said nice things too. I was also thinking nice things separately from her. So we really, really do appreciate all the time and thoughtful consideration and commitment you've given to the Housing Commission overall, as well as this bond process. I do have the word questions down here. I'm gonna start with one that's already come to our attention. And that is, what about the other items put on the ballot by other entities in the community, such as the school district, the jail district, et cetera? We, as the city of Flagstaff, do not have any control or say um, as to what other bodies put on the ballot, just like they don't over us. Um, we stay in communication with them through a group called the Alliance, which is all of our major governmental entities and we will see things we've already seen a couple also come forward there may be more there may not be more um as these groups take their independent actions and with that i would be happy to answer any questions you may have if i can i'll try and i think we have a question from nicole hi sarah hello um housing on prop 442 please I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, you cut out. You wanted me to go back to that slide? The 442 slide, please. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm confused about that first bullet point. I Can you help maybe clarify for that, that for me? I thought that the city couldn't create additional affordable rentals for their own, for the, the stuff that they own. So that bullet point is just a little confusing for me. Can you help me? I sure can. So redevelopment of city owned of housing owned and managed by the city here on the projects list was reworded to help people understand differently and it redevelop. We can create additional affordable units. That is the purpose of redevelopment, but we cannot create. I think I know what you're thinking of. If you'll forgive me for trying to read your mind from a distance is that we cannot create additional public housing units. We are yes. limited in public housing units. We are not limited in creating additional affordable rental units under another model. Nope. I, 
also have a question. The way that the proposition is worded, it doesn't specify what portions of the 20 million go to which bullet points. Does that mean, and when council made this decision, they were thinking this amount for this bullet point, this amount for this bullet point. Does that mean in the future there's going to be potentially flexibility in how much goes to those different bullet points? So that information will come forward in the informational pal palette. Wow, I'm having a hard time with that word today. With the informational pamphlet, those dollar amounts will be put in there. It is as a guideline. It, they are the numbers, and thank you. I'm sorry that I overlooked putting those numbers in here. That is my bad. Um, I had them written down. I don't know what I did with them on the slide. I must have deleted it. Anyway, yes, there's a certain amount of money for each one. Um, it totals $20 million, but leaving this um, a little open in the actual ballot language does give some future flexibility because if you will remember, uh, the recommendations actually revolve some of these things and um, that, that allows us long-term future flexibility, of course, only with decisions, recommendations from the Housing Commission and decisions by City Council. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. You'll notice that they're also not in the, the other one either. Yeah, I noticed that as well. Do we have any other questions or comments? And we don't have any members of the public raising a hand, do we? Member of the public? <laughs> it says to me virtually. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Hmm? I have one more question. Oh, yeah. Go. Okay. Um, is Prop 441 also secondary property tax, or how is that to be funded? They are both uh, primary. I'm sorry. They are both secondary property tax under general obligation bonds. Thank you. There's something, I have multiple follow-up questions. Um, you mentioned um, something about the jail, and I apologize, I've been um, not as engaged as I probably have been in the past. Um, I know the school board bond that's coming up is a secondary property tax. Is the jail, the, the other bond from the other governing body that you mentioned, is that also secondary property tax? I'm sorry, I can't answer that one at this point, but we can look and get back to you. Okay, thank you. Will someone with more attention to detail to me please write down that I said we do that. <laughs> thank you, Adriana. You're welcome. Other thank questions, you. thoughts, discussion? Oh, oh. We're, we're here, we're happy to have it. All right, I'll give like five seconds for someone to raise their hand or say something and if not we'll move on to agenda item 6b a 2022 to 23 community development block grant allocation update from christine pavlik the housing and grants administrator uh christine feel free to take us away awesome thank you so much i'm just gonna share my screen really quickly um there we go can everybody see the presentation uh yes awesome good afternoon commissioners i think most of you already know who i am but for any who don't my name is christine pavlik and i'm the housing and grants administrator for the housing section um thank you guys for your time today i'm just going to give you a brief update regarding the um, program year 2022 community development block grant um so i know we have a few new commissioners so i'll just quickly provide an overview of the cdbg program with a brief chat about this year's allocation process and then an update about um what were the final decisions for the annual action plan um, and then i also want to mention some upcoming funding opportunities that are going to be managed by the housing section so cdbg is what we call the community development block grant program it's a federal grant program that's administered by hud um, the national objective of the community development block grant program is the development of viable urban communities through the provision of the following so providing decent housing 
a suitable living environment, and economic opportunity, and all of those things must primarily serve low and moderate income persons. Um, the city of Flagstaff is considered an entitlement community, which means that we receive an annual application every year. We don't have to um, apply to receive that allocation. And so the amount that we receive is based on a formula um, that takes into consideration things like our population, the age of our housing stock, um, the congressional allocation for the program in general, and then also new entitlement communities that are um, popping up into the state or region. Um, essentially, to qualify as an entitlement community, you must have a population of 50,000 or more. And so as other cities grow, they're able to join the program um, and then they receive a portion of those allocations. So I think the most important thing to know is that we don't have any control or influence over the allocation from HUD um, as much as we might like to. <laughs> Along with serving low to moderate income persons to be eligible for CDBG funds, an activity has to qualify as one of the following. So either a limited clientele activity, which um, is benefits low to moderate income persons or those presumed to be low to moderate income. Um, Presu presumed um, populations are folks like survivors of domestic violence or individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Um, the next activity that's eligible is an housing activities, which provide or improve permanent residential structures, which will be occupied by low to moderate income persons. Um, the next is an area benefit activity. Um, these activities must benefit all of the residents in a low income neighborhood. And um, we are able through our, our five-year plan, um, established, we're able to establish target neighborhoods that are eligible for these area benefit projects, um, like neighborhood revitalization um, activities. So updates to parks or streets in those neighborhoods. And so we've designated four target neighborhoods that um, all have a high concentration of low income and minority households. Um, so 51% or more of low and moderate income households, many of these have 70%. Um, so those neighborhoods are Sunnyside, Southside, La Plaza Vieja, and Pine Knoll. And the last um, category for eligibility for eligible activities is economic development. And these are activities that create or retain jobs for low income workers or business owners or even just benefit small business owners that are low income, um, and sometimes uh, small businesses that provide services in target neighborhoods. Um, so CDBG also calls for extensive public participation during our annual action planning process. Um, we typically hold five public meetings. And so this year we actually started things off last summer with a meeting hosted in partnership with a League of Neighborhoods. And a League of Neighborhoods is a group of um, community associations and neighborhood associations that um, represent our target neighborhoods. So Pine Knoll does not have its own, um, but Southside, La Plaza Vieja, and Sunnyside all have neighborhood associations that have formed this alliance, a League of Neighborhoods. So that meeting was centered around listening to residents of not just our target neighborhoods, but our all neighborhoods, and just hearing about general resident concerns, receiving feedback on the needs and priorities they feel um, should be heard by the city. Um, and we had staff from community development, from capital projects, code enforcement, and parks and recreation. Um, the focus was really on needs that could potentially be addressed with um, CDBG, but really through a number of any funding sources. Um, then we had a second meeting with a League of Neighborhoods that was specifically for target neighborhoods and specifically to talk about CDBG funded projects. Um, and so this was an opportunity for departments to come with their ideas and receive feedback from residents of target neighborhoods. Um, and this is kind of a new partnership for us with a League of Neighbors. It's been um, a really great way to make sure that we are having participation from folks who live in those targeted um, neighborhoods that we have uh, want to focus our funding in. Um, the other, the other meetings that we hold are, um, we usually have a kickoff where we kind of explain the program and um, this year's application process. Then we review the applications that came in and finally we present to city council um, at a work session and then we come back at a meeting and request a resolution for submission of the annual action plan. So let's talk about this year's money. Um, this year, the housing section received from HUD just this last month, what our 2022 entitlement um, is and it's a little over $531,000. This is actually a decrease of nearly $50,000 from last year. Um, 
We also are able to use program income. What program is, is it's generated by the city's revolving loans and it's comprised of those returned interest fee loans from programs like our owner occupied rehab program or from um, past first time home buyer assistance programs. So those loans become payable when folks sell their homes or when they pull cash out of them during a refinance. And so um, because a lot of folks have been selling and refinancing their homes, we have received a substantial amount of program income this year and last. And so um, we also have reallocated funds. These are just funds that are from last year's programs or even a year or two before um, from subrecipients that just didn't use it all. Maybe they're, they didn't meet their budget um, for whatever reason, they didn't need all of the money that they had. And so um, we are able to recycle those funds into this year. So um, all things considered, we have a little over $809,000 in CDBG funds um, available to be allocated into our community. And here is what council decided to do with those funds. Um, so the first one on top there, the city of Flagstaff um, parks, recreation, open space and events section. They're going by pros. They um, were awarded funds for public facility improvements in the Southside community. So this is an area benefit activity. It's in our target neighborhood of Southside. Um, improvements include the installation of a small park and the reorientation of the parking lot at the Murdoch Center. Um, it'll also include repaving among a number of other needed and desirable changes. So basically, um, it's going to improve the outside area of the Murdoch um, neighborhood um, building or the Murdoch Community Center, um, not the inside, but um, it will also include kind of creating a public park over there. And so um, that will serve uh, a thousand low and moderate income households living in that south side area and that census tract. Um, Flagstaff Shelter Services uh, was awarded funding for public facility improvements for their newly purchased motel. It's called the Crown. I'm sure you all have heard of it. Um, it's very exciting. So this is going to include needed safety improvements and it's going to serve um, a thousand individuals experiencing homelessness per year. Um, and it's utilizing their 56 unit non congregate um, shelter. And so that also includes 12 family units. Um, so it helps to ensure that those units are um, safe and that the infrastructure of the of the motel is sound. Um, those are our two what are considered housing projects. Um, the last three here in bold are considered public service program um, activities. And so we're actually limited on the amount of funds we're able to use for public services. Um, we're only able to use 15%. So um, these are usually much smaller awards. Um, we usually max out that, that category because public services are so needed. Um, funding for those public services is so needed in our community. Um, and then the remainder of the funds usually goes to construction type projects. So under our public service category this year, we were able to allocate to Homeless Youth Connection. Um, they requested funding for their Empowering Youth for the Future program. And this is actually an expansion of um, the program that we we funded um, a year ago. And so their, their goal is to use CDBG funds to establish what's called their host family program. Um, their host family program provides temporary housing for youth who are experiencing homelessness and finishing their high school program. Um, so these are unattended youth, youth that are, are homeless and not, um, or unaccompanied youth, I'm sorry, and are not with their families for whatever reason. Um, Threaded Together has also requested funds for a program expansion. They um, received funding two years ago um, to create an apprenticeship program. Um, it's called STEP, Sewing and Textile Employment Pathways. Um, this will allow them to serve six low to moderate income individuals before they were only serving victims of domestic violence. Now they will income qualify the folks who can take a um, part of this apprenticeship. Um, essentially, this funding allows them to pay a stipend to those um, apprentices, apprentices so that they um, are able to take part of the program without having to worry about not being able to um, generate income while they are part of the training program. Um, and then our last uh, activity was with Flagstaff Shelter Services. And so this is actually operations at the Crown. Um, and so we primarily funded that request with ARPA congregate care funds, which I'll talk about in a minute. 
but we had um, extra funding in the public service category. And so we um, we use that to provide funding um, for this program to get us a little closer to their request. Um, and so this will allow them to operate their um, hotel to housing um, services, their wraparound services. Um, operations usually pays for salaries as well as maybe um, utility bills, things like that. So um, we submitted those allocations to HUD. Um, I think it was just two weeks ago now. Um, it's actually not due till July 11th, but we were ahead of the game. Um, and so the next step is for HUD to approve our annual action plan, and then we'll be able to start the contracting process with those subrecipients, um, hopefully in October. Um, so some other funds that um, the housing section is excited to be managing are the ARPA, coronavirus um, state and local fiscal recovery funds. We're just calling them local recovery funds. Um, council uh, directed um, categories for these funds back in October, and um, we've just been working with the management services grants and contracts team to um, kind of iron out a process for awarding these funds. So the first category we went with was the congregate care services. These funds were really urgently needed by our congregate care providers. So we were able to award on an emergency basis $100,000 to Flagstaff Shelter Services for some of the expenses, the great, great expenses that they have incurred over the last two years um, in payroll and motel fees. If you guys remember, they were putting folks in motel rooms in order to um, keep them the vulnerable our vulnerable community members safe from coronavirus. Um, then we were able to provide some payroll expenses and HVAC improvements for Northland Family Help Center. Um, then we did a uh, solicitation process um, for the remainder of those funds. Catholic Charities received a little over $88,000 for improvements at um, two of their shelters, group homes, and um, one of their permanent supportive housing um, locations. And then Flagstaff Shelter Services um, received the remaining of those funds, a little over $135,000 for operations at the Crown. So next up, we are going to be um, working on our solicitation process for the housing assistance programs funding. That's $1.9 million. And we have decided to go ahead and start with a request for statements of interest from um, local organizations um, or agencies. So we're hoping to release that request for statements of interest in mid-July, receive those statements back from um, potential community partners in early August, and then release a full um, notification or notice of funding availability and request for proposals and applications. And so hopefully we will have all of those applications um, submitted. Our plan is for um, early September and or mid September, and then we will spend about a month evaluating those and deciding um, how to award those funds out. Um, the plan is to ask council for approval sometime in the beginning of December um, before we switch to potentially new council members. Um, then we will also um, administer the aid to victim services funds. Um, a lot of those nonprofits have requested that those funds be um, available for um, request after the fall because they really um, need them for their fiscal year 2023 um, when they are expecting to have um, funds cut from the victim, the, the federal victim services funding sources. Um, so that is the plan with those funds. And that's my update. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much for that update. Do you have any questions? I heard something on the audio. I don't have a C or a Q. Oh. Um, it looks like Adrian's got his hand up. Christine, you're still showing your screen. Oh, I am. Thank you. I just had a, I have a general question. Is this pretty normal um, with the budget that you uh, that we fund a lot of these kind of auxiliary auxiliary services throughout the community? Is that kind of yeah? I'm not familiar with the budget, so I guess that's my question. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, yes, so we 
basically CDBG funds are, are kind of council's only discretionary funds for um, these community development programs that benefit low and moderate income individuals and households. And so um, we always expect to receive somewhere between like 500 to $700,000 um, annually from HUD for this program. Um, and typically, yes, we have historically always used the funds to serve um, I'd say a mix of those neighborhood revitalization projects and homeless services. Um, some of the things we've done in the past is we helped um, the shelter with their expansion. Um, we have done improvements at Sharon Manor, um, as well as, you know, we try to use those public service funds. Oftentimes they um, are most crucially needed by our service providers that are serving um, homeless households. Um, but we have been able I think probably because of the addition of all of uh, the coronavirus um, relief funds that were able to be used for some of those um, more vulnerable populations, we were able to use CDBG funds for some of these um, like economic development and apprenticeship training programs, which is kind of newer um, for, for these funds. Hopefully that answered your question. Uh, yes. Um. So some of these, like uh, some of these programs, like the internships and um, training. So what's going to happen? Like one, you know, sort of the COVID boost in funds goes away. Is it likely that you know those programs will then decline? That's a great question. So one of the things we do when we evaluate proposals is try to understand the potential for the program to exist without CDBG funding. We um, have always made it very clear that they're not to expect ongoing funding. Um, one, because we never know how much we're gonna have in CDBG funding. And two, because we don't wanna pour money into a program that's only gonna exist for that one year that they have funding from us. And so um, typically we will fund organizations that have an established um, funding sources and that this allows them to have time to expand the program, show that it's working, and then access funds from other sources. Um, usually we require it to be an expansion of a program. So like when we fund um, Flagstaff Shelter Services year over year, it's because they're expanding their program or they're changing it in some way. So initially we might have funded them for um, front door or case management, then we stepped it up to fund their actual wraparound services, their housing to health as healthcare um, or job training services. So usually it's always an expansion of um, service and we ask that they have other funding sources identified to carry on that service at that level. All right, thank you. Looks like we've got a question from Devana. Hey, Devana, go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, so, Christine, given the fact that it doesn't sound like the 1.9 million in ARPA funding is going to be available for a while, um, is it like regular CDBG where um, expenses can't be incurred until you get your notice of award, or can it be used to pay back expenses for expansion of projects or construction? Yeah, very good question. So um, that's one of the things that's great about the ARPA local recovery funds is that they can cover expenses um, from back on, I believe it's March 21st, 2021, when the bill was signed into law. Um, so the expenses from there all the way to December 31st, 2024. So, um, and the other nice thing is that we don't have to do environmental reviews. We don't have to wait for HUD approval. We're able to get those contracts approved by council in, like I said, late November, or early December, um, and then they can immediately be um, be signed by the um, nonprofit as well. And then we can issue a notice to proceed and billing can start immediately with expenses going back to March 21st, 2021. And then is there any clarification on income limits yet or not? Yes, so um, essentially the Treasury has an overview of their final rule that does talk about income limits. It looks to be um, like I think the average for most were 185% of area median income. Um, however, it is uh, strongly urged that folks serve um, disproportionately impacted um, groups. And so while 
everyone was obviously negatively impacted by the pandemic, there are groups that were um, impacted in a much more severe way. And so the funds are to be um, to be used for folks who are disproportionately impacted. So 60, their suggestion is 60% of the area median income or below. But we do have, like I said, flexibility. So, I mean, priorities and preferences are all well and good, but it doesn't matter unless it's the decision maker. So is it like there'd be higher points for lower income served or, or how will council address that? Do you have any idea or the review committee? So that'll be up to the review committee. And yes, that is probably what we will. Um, we're still kind of figuring that out. That's part of why we wanted to kind of gauge community um, information on on projects that are feasible for them and that um, what what communities or people of color or income levels um, they intend to serve. Um, get that information and then determine, you know, if there's not a lot of projects that are are serving a much higher um, area median income, then maybe we don't worry about awarding extra points to lower income um, individuals. But chances are it would be that um, folks that are serving those more disproportionately impacted are going to have uh, more points on the application. Thank you. All right, do we have any other questions? Ross. Ross? Hey everyone, I was just wondering, um, Christine, do you have any information? I know that there is, there are other um, allocations coming out of the ARPA funding that will have um, direct or indirect um, implications for people around housing and shelter and unsheltered folks. And I'm wondering if there has been any process or dissemination of um, review on how that those funding uh, sources will be uh, disseminated and really um, discerning how they're going to get spent. You know, that's a great question, and I am not familiar with that at all. That's something we can ask Stacy Breckler Nags. She's our um, grants and contracts manager um, and to see if they have a plan for those funds, but it's not something I'm familiar with, unfortunately. Great, thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions or discussion, um, first off, thank you for that update, Christine. Um, we'll move on to item 7A, an update on the Housing Authority Commission. And Moses, the Housing Authority Commission member, is not here. So, Sarah Dar, would you be able to give an update in his stead? When Sarah Dar can find the mute button, yes. Um, it's not a very lengthy update. We are struggling with membership and quorum. So we continue to make a plea and do very targeted outreach for people to join the Housing Authority Board, but we have been uh, required to cancel meetings due to lack of quorum. So it's a super short and sweet update. Thank you so much. I actually have a question. So we've got a variety of applicants for the Housing Commission that are going to be considered. If some of those members are not put onto the Housing Commission, could we ask them if they're interested in applying to the Housing Authority Commission, if they have relevant background? Because, you know, they serve similar interests. Yeah. So, so there are times where we have done exactly that, um, at least said, by the way, did you know there's two? Um, one of our other challenges with the Housing Authority Board is that we are required to have by federal regulation um, a member of one of our programs, someone who either lives in public housing or utilizes a Section 8 or other associated voucher. So we have one general spot open right now, but our almost bigger need, similar to this commission needing um, a builder or um, developer, is we need that low income member representation on our board as well. So we do occasionally reach across and say, hey, by the way, would you be interested? Um, the charges are pretty different within the two bodies. 
and we've had quite a few people say no, but we continue to try what we can. Okay. Well, thank you for that update. If no discussion or questions, we'll move on to item 7B, updates from housing commissioners and other informational items. So I'll open it up. Does anyone have any updates they'd like to give? Commissioner Michael Laughlin. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, thank you. I was just wondering if there was an update on the RAD um, partnership contract with the private sector developer to move that project. I am happy to provide that update. Uh, we continue to work back and forth with their attorneys and our attorneys to try to reach um agreement on the form of contract moving forward as well as what's in it so that work continues and other than that that's all we've got at this point thank you okay and if no one else yes nicole are you able to um sorry hi um are you able to let the current commission know who what commissioner terms are expiring and who has reapplied and who will not be reapplied oh, okay so i actually need a list just in case that question was made <laughs> so um So the terms that are expiring, um, the building and real estate professional um, is going to be Jackie. Jackie um, has gotten an email from me about reapplying. The two low-income housing experts is going to be Nicole and Ross. Ross has reapplied at this point. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Would you want that sent in the email for reference? No, it's good. Okay. Any All right. Then finally, we are on agenda agenda item seven C updates from housing staff. Staff, any updates? I have just one quick update, and that is that the position of vacated by Via Blue, um, which we are now changing the title to, from, um, I don't even remember what it used to be, it was so long. It is now going to be housing program manager. Um, that position is going, the position that's actually what Adriana is doing interim right now. Um, it will open live on the city's website on Friday. And so if you know of anyone interested, um, feel free to tell them to apply. It will be open for two weeks. And then we're hoping to close the recruitment and get some on board. That sounds great. All right. And if no other updates from city staff, thank you everyone for your time. This meeting is adjourned at 2.03 p.m. Everyone have a good day. Nice work. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Have a great summer. Thanks, everyone. Um,